Good morning. Good afternoon, actually. Uh, this session will discuss um, the uh, global tectonics. We will um, the new tectonics of geopolitics. So I will introduce members of the panel. I'll start with uh, Arancha Gonzalez Laya, who is our coordinator today, former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Spain. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Jean-Marc Collanier, who is General Director of Accenture, uh, Europe, Africa, Middle East. Melissa Bell, who is a European correspondent, CNN European correspondent based in Paris. Hubert Vedrine, who needs no introduction, Foreign uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hubert Vedrine. And Sir Peter Ricketts, who is the former French ambassador of Great Britain in France, uh, who is now a member of the Chamber of the Lords. To start the session, let's listen to the for former Spanish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Aranches. Thank you very much. This is not an easy topic. I'll try to decipher if the um, the geopolitical situation is going to lead us, take us to a new uh, new uh, resurgence of the blocks. Well, first of all, this is a time. These are times of confusion. They are. Uh, forces pulling in different uh, directions. We don't know where we're going, and therefore the question is to try to understand such forces, to get a, to have our words, to, the words to send the way it's going to sh be going to shape it. Let me sp speak about the three forces. First, geopolitics. On the one hand, there is huge rivalry between China and U.S. and the U.S., which. Mm, leads us to thinking about a bipolar, fragmented world. But next to this, there is the rise of a whole series of powers, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. And they kind of disrupt those block logics by they, they, they are sort of uh, uh, creating new, launching new bridges. They create, launch new transactional policies to play all the all the actors. Then, the second force is geography. We can see on television East and West, China, U.S. Aggravated by the uh, Russian uh, Ukraine war, East West. So centers of interest are technology, which shapes such relations, technology that will enable one or the other to be hegemonic in the future. But next to East and West, there is also North and South. In the South, concerns are somewhat different. Debt and climate change, the impact of climate change, third force economy. On the one hand, Uh, fields for decoupling uh, restriction of international trade, uh, such as technologies, but at the same time, international trade, which is uh, breaking records between the US and China, for example, 680 uh, 90 billion last year alone. So, a new geo geopolitical alignment, which is not uh, which can be seen in economic terms. But uh, uh, to close, Elias, one big question, what will be the role of the European Union? Can it uh, play uh, between the two giants, East and West, North and South? Can it be the guarantor of a international uh, trade system based on rules. Questions, but I'm sure there will be plenty of answers. Ulysses, you have the floor. Thank you. Since you're talking about Europe, Arantxa, I will straight away give the floor to Peter Ricket, who will give us his vision. It is true today, as you say, we face uh, 
We were in times of confusion. Everything is uh, floating in uncertainty uh, with two major risks. First, the risk of new conflicts. We already faced that in Ukraine, which could spread somewhere elsewhere in Europe. It's a true threat. And then there is a risk of uh, fragmentation of the world with uh, block against block logics. There is a word, an expression, which is, um, is sort of a buzzword, the global cells. You know, we talk about non-aligned country, but now the fashionable uh, buzzword is global cells. What is it? Well, we might discuss that. So today, there is a risk of fragmentation of the world. This is why we we called it the uh, global tectonics. But there is also the race uh, between uh, climate change and energy transition taking place throughout the world, but which takes time, actually. So this, this is the theater. Uh, Ambassador, how do you see this world in full confusion? And can Europe play a role? Yulis, a great pleasure to be back in AX. Let's start with positive aspects. The Ukraine war was a strategic, strategic disaster for Putin. NATO is uh, uh, now st stronger, more united, wider than it was ever, uh, was ever been. Division within the Russian elite are clear. So uh, I think there will be an updating of a defense system and decision system, the largest ever since the Cold War. The courage of, uh, of the Ukrainian population and uh, supported with Western weapons destroyed the myth of Russian invis invisibility. This is essential and it places us in the nearing the end of uh, Putin's regime. I don't know how it's going to take place, but uh, I mean, now we, I think this is what we are uh, seeing in Europe. We free from the, uh, our dependence on uh, Russian energy. The second vendor is spreading in all European countries almost. Europe as a power so wished by our French friends is, uh, well, it's coming, it's, take, it's taking place even slowly. And even the European-UK relationship are improving following the with all treaty, but this Western unity is fragile. Uh, we, do we have to rely on the solidarity of the European taxpayers, or US taxpayers, to increase the defense budget on a durable way uh, for the huge cost of reconstruction that uh, will be needed in Ukraine? Biden is, uh, President Biden is clearly setting up uh, the new uh, protectionist policies and should, you know, especially to uh, block Trump, should he come back to power. So Arantxa said there is a key question that is the increasing confrontations between the U.S. and China, a confrontation which is in the economic, financial, technological, and digital domains. For the time being, the European Union, the UK, uh, are, have, have implement converging policies with China. But could we avoid uh, not making choice? And there is this issue of non-aligned countries, because India is in the north in a way, but uh, like very much like South Africa and Brazil, like Saudi Arabia and others, uh, it has decided not to uh, take position and uh, when it comes to Ukraine, uh, which they, they, they considered that the individual uh, law of, uh, the, of this new space order is of interest to them. This is a warning signal to all that we should not ignore. Now, this leads me this leads me to a question so that we will have time for uh, discussions. And I'm sure there will be questions from the US. Of course, they will find our position between uh, the, US, the US and China. If there is a war in Taiwan, well, we'll be on the US side. That we cannot uh, stay aside, uh, you know, the French president, uh, you know, uh, disregarding the French president this co uh, comment. But is it the right time to push this question of our strat European strategic autonomy? Strategic, yes, we do have to think about the long-term strategy in Europe, but autonomous? 
Well, I'm not sure time has come for that. We should think in terms of alliance, in your transatlantic European alliance with uh, allied countries in Asia, Australia, Japan, South Korea. And for non-aligned countries, well, we need to listen to them better. We need to understand them. We have to show that their priorities, such as climate change, are our priorities as well, and that uh, state of law is serving their interest. This is a further reason for uh, Putin to lose this war. Well, you do mention the key issue for Europe, that is strategic autonomy. You did mention the role of NATO and the reinforcement of NATO after the uh, beginning of the Russian war. Melissa Bell, you are a CNN correspondent in Paris for Europe. We are a few days from the NATO summit, uh, which will play a key role because of the conflict in progress, but to know if indeed uh, the time could uh, open NATO could open its door to Ukraine. How is this perceived, experienced, and in the US, do they talk about this possibility? And this, uh, well, the the autonomy, we, Sir Rick had mentioned it, uh, the, the gathering that took place on the first year of the war, most unexpected NATO, which was unified that it had never been, and galvanized, you know, because of its ideals and uh, liberal democracy, yet I think the more it uh, uh, lasts, uh, uh, we have uh, now a front line frozen. We expect uh, determination to fail on one side or the other, you know, and more natural internal division of NATO will be felt, especially in Vilnius, Swedish, uh, uh, you know. Uh, the Turkish don't want the Swedish and they, you know, and the forces before. Macron said in 2019 that uh, it was uh, NATO was brain dead. NATO experienced uh, NATO. There was a revival because they, there was a war, wanted to fight for ideals and uh, suddenly attacked, you know, the new space order. But the longer it lasts, but in fact, this uh, conflict will show the true failures of the NATO side, on the NATO side, the weaknesses. You talked about the BRICS early on. Well, you talked about the, the BRICS, where we talk about two-thirds of the world population, 50% of the world economy, which today, they come out of this by themselves, you know, aware of their strengths, and this will have meant, indicated the end of this uh, Ukraine confrontation, the idea we had post-Second World War, you know, certainty, natural uh, order, the uh, progress of democracy, liberal order, and contestation is even uh, st is strong, especially strong because the countries we're talking about uh, do not uh, pay attention to this regional world. They pay attention to other crises, energy crisis, food crisis, climate, glo global warming. But this confrontation is such that these are uh, challenges that we cannot really tackle today. Well. We can see the main problem, the risk to see this uh, unit around uh, Ukraine uh, uh, getting sh shattered and the, the, f the problems of fragmentation of the world or even within NATO and the, the questioning of globalization. Now, Jean-Marc Collagnier, who is the manager of Accent for Europe, Middle East and Africa, now, big corporations, how do they deal with this uh, uncertainty, this risk of new conflicts? Uh, Ambassador Rick had talked about the risk of conflict in Taiwan. We can see the world is some kind of, uh, you know, a min minefield. So how do you do with it? The world is complicated. And for international companies, you know, uh, geopolitics, has invited itself in our board of directors and our COMEX for a few years now. Accenture is a company which is present in more than 50 countries in the world, 730 
people in the world, one of the first private employers. We are involved in the global south, we are involved in, the, in all parts of the world, and we look at geopolitics, as you can imagine, with a lot of interest because it may have an impact on our decisions. A couple of concrete examples on what we had to do. Well, COVID made it possible, strangely enough, to learn a lot about uh, pro issues of resilience. Because within a month, I remember three years ago, we get our com everybody worked at home. You know, it was you know in one month we had to shift 730,000 people who worked in offices, our offices, and we learned what it meant to test our resilience. So today, what is going on? Well, today, as what happened to me a few years ago, I had to shut down Russia. I had 2,300 employees in Russia. Some of them left. Uh, I had to shut down the offices because half of my customers were uh, facing sanctions and the other half were, were leaving anyway. So I had to start, uh, close down the offices, shut the offices, and I'm still in touch with my colleagues, former Russian colleagues. Business is, uh, keeps going, you know. They, so we tried to take a stand as a citizen company. I do have a lot of Ukrainians in Accenture. I'm, first, I'm the largest private employer in Poland, and I have a lot of Ukrainians in Poland. Together with the Polish government, I did a special training for Ukrainian women who were uh, you know, uh, fleeing from their countries. So we are somewhat supporting a movement of refugees major in uh, Europe and now. Um, our employees are expecting us to get mobilized. So I've signed documents uh, in which my company will be uh, involved in the rebuilding uh, of uh, Ukraine when that will be possible on the digital side, of course. Now, what happens is that the world, as I we said, is complicated. It's a bit of a mess, to be honest, you know, <laughs> to say the least. And we had to learn in our businesses to be resilient. What's essential for us is to keep running keep our operations regardless of the conditions we face. And I'm rather optimistic, actually. I think our business, our companies, you know, we we dealt with that rather well today, what we need to do. We talked about res energy resilience. This is a major topic in Europe. You know, high price of energy. We talked about supply chain. I mean, you've all heard about the supply chain. It's a key problem when we, uh, we diversify the supply chain to be certain that we can keep working. In my personal experience, the most resilience is that of cybersecurity. Because behind the geopolitical tension that experts around the table talk about, there is a digital warfare. Digital war, sorry, the number of uh, uh, cybersecurity incidents have exploded. And digital security is essential because today, you know, uh, digital is part of all chain of value of company, you know, producing, engineering, uh, supply chain, manufacturing, whatever. So you need to protect businesses. And this is a key topic, a major topic for companies like ours, all companies throughout the world, you know. this. Uh, to be better protected vis-à-vis -vis a new challenge, a new war, where means are huge, and uh, co companies will put a huge, uh, gigantic means, not just to protect their head offices, but through the, throughout the entire chain of value. This is a key element uh, which has to continue because our concern is that we have to be resilient we're not too sure about what's going to happen because the macroeconomic models have been explained that business was going to collapse for two years, but in fact, business is not doing too badly, actually. And we've, well, okay, we, we knew better times, you know, but uh, yeah, we've been through better times, but we don't know what's going to happen. Macroeconomic models are not fairly clear, very clear, but we need to be resilient on all these aspects I've mentioned. And all this is what we work on, mostly the digital aspect, because it's going to be a war, a very nasty war, and it will continue, and uh, it will, uh, a company like ours will have to adapt themselves. We do, we do get adapted, and we're rather optimistic, because the only thing, okay, what, could, could there be anything worse? Well, we've seen quite a lot of disasters in the last three, four years. Well, so far, so good, but you know, uh, I'm confident for the, the, the rest, but of course we'd like more stability. We'd like a bit more stability in the world today.
Yes, we we keep in mind your optimistic view, but also this underground war and the major problem of cyber security for businesses, which is even more difficult to manage than a, conven a conventional warfare such as a conflict like you can. Uber Vedrina. To close this uh, first round table discussion, uh, is this the end of globalization? Are we going to a regionalization of globalization? And for you, is that the world remains dominated by the uh, uh, the fight between America and the U.S.? Well, globalization will continue, but in a different way. We're no longer in the American globalization, you know, which dominated the last decades with the illusions of many people, especially in Europe, saying something else. But it's not the end. It's not the closing. It's more fragmentation, diversification. And we can't even think in terms of blocks. It's more complicated. But I would say, the for me, the main problem for me is the race between the deterioration of life conditions on on the in the world. I'm talking about human beings, and the deterioration of life conditions, not just the climate, but there is the rest, and the race that is the answer, the response, the ecologization, the greening. Uh, we talked about the industrialization of all modes of production, you know, uh, all modes of energy, all modes of, of uh, travel, of uh, mobility. You know, this was going to dominate everything, but it's an illusion. You know, we were delusional when we thought about that. Uh, or can we think about geopolitics or macroeconomics with all the uh, discussions? It's no longer possible. So this will involve everything everywhere, everybody. Now, down to geopolitics now. The key element, in my opinion, it doesn't change here, really, but the key, the tectonic, you know, the tectonic plates, you know, are slow to move. You know, the Western countries are no longer have the monopoly. Uh, you know, it's the, 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 the monopoly of the Europeans talk that it will be a, a, a international politics is something else. We don't have the monopoly. Otherwise, there would not be what we call in the global south, other than on the line. And the China could not uh, challenge the others. So we we keep a huge power, key, a huge wealth, uh, inventivity, but we do no longer control the system. So in this system, the US wants to remain number one. The U.S. want to remain with political variation, but they want to remain number one. They don't want another one to become number one, especially China. They do everything in their power to stop that, to block them. So I'm mentioning China, but you know, and uh, this, uh, likewise, just as in the Ukraine-Russia business, <clears throat> Russian's aggression was evident, condemned by 140 countries. But 40 countries, which represent two thirds of the EU of mankind, decided not to take stand. And they don't like Putin, they don't like Russia, they don't like war, but they didn't want to make a choice. They don't want to come back automatically to the Western side. Uh, don't be indignated. The history is there. So likewise for China. Several countries in the world don't want to be in the automatic uh, movement of China. And President Macron was right to say that. It was wrong to say it, but he, has, he was right to think that we should not be followers, especially nobody knows exactly what will be the US policy uh, towards China in 10 years. Who will be president? On what ground? The Taiwan question might have been maybe maybe swell, disappeared or erased for the reason. So we are in a global situation. There are marked sides, but it could be the non-aligned Europeans on China, about China. They want to pay more attention, but, but they don't want to be untrained in something. So we're dealing with a with a world which is difficult to foresee, which chaotic, which could be dangerous. Consequences for Europe are huge. For example, the Putin's attack has reinvented NATO. He reactivated the spirit of defense in Europe. So this is uh, he has reorganized the uh, European system today. There is no basis for French position. So you know, which were argued for for years with more energy by Macron, but it was for a long time. So no, there is no longer any basis. So so today, one day, Europeans with Germany, which don't want to have an army, Poland, the Ukraine will be in and out in France. There will be a battle, new battle, original battle on who will get the leadership on for security in Europe 
the day after tomorrow. So, so it has nothing to do with the thousands of uh, conferences on European defense. Based on the idea, it was the, around France. So, the French positions, well, uh, a vision that is, uh, you know, that's why, uh, that's why the French, the French president adopts different positions in unexpected position about on this topic. But France needs a huge uh, uh, restoration or reshuffling program. So. In this uh, table I've drawn rapidly, what is uh, most uncertain is Europe. Europe. And even if Europe uh, become more realistic, there are less, uh, you know, uh, uh, to be uh, tilly tobies, you know, they don't want, they want to be protected by the US, but will it be eternal? They don't want to have to face China, but is it possible? They don't want to reinvent uh, the Pacific coexistence with Russia, but uh, uh, they want to do it, but not just now. And the South, you know, they'd like the South not to sh sh tilt on the si China side, but, you know, French companies are, are disturbed, uh, weakened by the uh, the crisis of represent democracy in all democracies. There is some kind of a violent upsurge of direct democracy, you know, unapplicable with governments which try to uh, invent participative democracy, which has never worked anyway. And unfortunately, those who uh, know least what they want are the Europeans. So they have got a lot of nice ideas, but uh, they cannot articulate them. So this is how I see the, uh, the global vision on the geopolitical situation, the, in my opinion, Europeans should be able to synthesize their strategic interest, and uh, but they no longer think in terms of strategic interest. And the idea that uh, globalization is the same is good for everybody. No, no, it's a view of the mind. Yeah, there is a conceptual work and theoretical political work to be done. I'm sorry, I'm not really filling you with enthusiasm here. Yes, but you have noted that the subject has been put on the table in great style by all of our speakers. So the question that Hubert Védrine brings to the table is, what about Europe? Europe has managed to remain united whilst Ukraine is being invaded, and it's reinventing itself a little bit by relocating, by jointly producing the vaccines to begin with, and then ammunition for the Ukraine. So there have been many positive changes, but by the same token, Europe really does have to find its voice, which isn't an easy thing. So let me turn back to uh, Arincha, our, former, uh, our colleague from Spain. We're thinking about uh, strategic autonomy here and NATO, which is being strengthened thanks to the war in Ukraine. What is the pathway for Europe? Well, let me use a catchphrase here. When I look at myself, I'm a bit kind of sad with what I see, but when I compare myself to others, then perhaps I'm not so unhappy after all. So let's be realistic. We have to be realistic about our strengths, but also our weaknesses. And I think that this starting point is very important because the very worst thing that could happen would be to imagine that we are stronger than we really are. So we are constantly undergoing construction, but we have also shown our ability to continue to construct. We did that during the 2008 crisis. Oh yes, we were so slow. Yes, it cost such a lot of money. We did that be in COVID as well. We managed to have European integration. And as a civil servant at the bottom of the ladder in 1987, I would never have imagined the pooling of our investments in Europe. That is an amazing and a major point. Of course, pessimists will tell us that that was only once and we've forgotten all about that. Optimists will say, Oh, it's great, we'll continue like this, as if everything was fine and dandy. Activists, the activists that we should be, must continue to fight every day to strengthen the European Union. All around the world today, between China and the United States, the only way for the European Union and its member states, starting with France, the only way we can survive is to make steps further every day towards a stronger European Union. Yes, it's difficult. Well, it's, it doesn't mean it was easy for the Americans or the Chinese either. You'll have noted 
that we're talking about the end of the Western monopoly, to use uh, Vedrin's words. We haven't really talked about uh, everything. We've talked about the Global South. We've talked about the need to discuss more and to have the Europeans' voice heard out in the Global South. Ambassador Ricketts, how would you respond to that desire for greater activism? And is Europe obliged to try to choose between China and uh, Euro and America? You're British. Does Europe have to choose Washington or Beijing in case of a conflict? Well, let's not forget that we would not have been able to withstand Putin in the Ukraine without the states. The states have carried the largest burden in terms of weaponry and also funding for Ukraine up until now. The United States have chosen to refocus on European security. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to focus on China, but they've decided to uh, reinforce their military presence here in Europe. As the minister has said, they've decided to reinvent NATO for a new Cold War. So are we going to stand on the sidelines if there is a confrontation, if there's a conflict between the USA and China about Taiwan? I don't think we will. I don't think we can simply wait for the Americans to be the loyal allies of Europe, whereas we sit on the fence if there's a conflict between them. I'm not saying that we're going to send our troops, no. But it must be clear that it's to our advantage to have the rule of law. And if China invades Taiwan, well, the same question arises, the same problem as with Putin in Ukraine. We will have to take a stance, but as far as the Global South is concerned, we have been far too negligent for absolutely years. We have not paid enough attention to the Chinese and the Russian, knowing that they are working in those countries, using with their money, their weaponry. Well, how can we go about being more attentive to the, South, the Global South? Well, first of all, Let's stop being stopped by not by not being so obsessed about our European quarrels such as Brexit, which was a downright mistake, admittedly. But we've let's listen and let's uh, rise to the challenges of climate, for example. Yes, Hubert Vedrin, you wanted to come back on this question of a Chinese American uh, conflict. Yes, I don't think that this challenge, this um, conflict will take place. I think even in a few years down the line, I don't think China would take that monstrous risk of attacking Taiwan because the United States will be forced to stop them. Otherwise, the um, otherwise the American guarantee would not be worth anything anywhere. The Chinese think that they will manage other way, in another way. So I'm not talking about a military scenario here. I may be mistaken. And if there is a military scenario, then the Europeans will not be on the side of the Chinese. That's impossible. But they will do everything to prevent it from happening. There are so many forces in the States and China and Southeast Asia and elsewhere so that it will not take place in that format. It will be much more sneaky, much more... Uh, undercover but many people are thinking and the Pentagon is saying that China could attack in the beginning of 2027 20, there will be some anticipated initiatives and I think it will play out differently what is the the number one likelihood for you the number one scenario well I think China will move its pawns forward China threatens Taiwan has operation, cyber operations, develops uh, a party in Taiwan who doesn't want war. So it would be more uh, backhanded, if you like, and a bit sneaky, a complicated type of conflict. But that's not the only scenario. All kinds of things could happen. 
We signed the Atlantic Alliance. The Europeans asked the Americans for that. We begged the Americans to protect us. And the, there's Article 5, which meant that the West, uh, well, there isn't any global alliance with an Article 5 that obliges us to follow the United States anywhere. Otherwise, we would have had to have war in Iraq, and de Gaulle would not have been able to say what he said about Indochina. Perhaps when the time comes, well, if we go with the Americans or we don't, it will be because we will have decided. Um, I think that Macron should have had his own thoughts but kept them to himself. He shouldn't have spoken out. So are we going to manage to create links again with these non-aligned countries? Because here we're not talking about Africa, China. The non-aligned countries cannot be broached as a Western bloc. You have to pick them one by one. So my perspective is not at all the same. Let me just add that whilst waiting to find out what China will or will not do, what Be Beijing will or will not do in relation to Taiwan, let's not forget the American stance. I think here, uh, with the Ukraine, we had the final shuddering of uh, multilateralism where the United States were trying to lead the world towards something better or more liberal. Finally, the Republican position has always been one of isolationism. And that, in my mind, is what w the future will look like. And whilst Beijing is waiting to act or not, the internal forces of the states will have changed a lot. Let's think about this issue of the Ukraine. That was a shadow which showed strength of a people who wanted its freedom, democracy, rather than autocracy. But at the end of the day, Putin's strength and I think he's nearly at the end of his road, but his strength has been from the very outset, years before this, because this war has just made concrete some things which are underway. Uh, Beijing's and uh, Moscow's position has been that we need a multilateral world where autocrats can be autocratic, where institutions in the West were not there to stand on a soapbox and give us lessons. Even in the short term, if Putin is going to lose this war in the longer term, then that completely different position of mini-lateralism with certain powers who were un unpredictable, unstable, and all of these forces that are prisoners of their own internal um, instability, they will perhaps decide to act together. So in the longer term, that's what Beijing, well, that's Beijing's and Moscow's argument, which is winning out. Well, we'll ask the uh, room to, for their question soon, but in the meantime, there's a question that a lot of people are wondering about, Melissa. In a year's time, you've got the American elections. Will Trump win that election? And if he does get back into power, what will that change? Oh, it's so unpredictable. I don't know if that's the worst option. Anything is possible. I think they haven't a clue. They don't know either. But once again, in the Ukraine, um, the West, like NATO, got all together and powered up behind this scenario, this notion of what democracy is, what this idea of freedom is. But. I don't know in the long term if that's going to be enough to compensate those real fractures, the intellectual fractures, not to mention the economic ones, and ideological fractures within our society in the long term. I don't think so. A final point with Jean-Marc. Hubert Védrine said that uh, Beijing, Washington will not go to conflict uh, on a head-to-head on a -head basis, but there will be a, like a big game of backgammon. And in backgammon, there's this cyber security. We see that the government here in France is worried about TikTok. How are these businesses organizing themselves? We can see the threats. We can see what's at stake. We know that it's necessary to have firewalls. So what does this mean? Uh, what are businesses doing? Are they constantly uh, fighting a war against uh, cyber attacks? Well, I prefer to talk about resilience. 
Because the concept of uh, resilience, as I've described it, is the main challenge for any society to function properly. We are here to serve our clients, work with our employees, we're responsible also for behaving and acting in our ecosystem. Today what we really need to understand that for businesses is that digital technologies are everywhere. It, all through the value chain, there it is. The concept which we're developing is protecting your business, the resilience of your business. We need to change business mindsets to take on board this uh, risk management. So as a CEO, what do you say? Well, we're training people. We realize very often that this cybersecurity risk involves a lot of tools, a lot of technology, but it's also a question of training and processes and reviewing the governance of, uh, of a company. So these are things which one has to take on board in everything we do. Today, we're noticing that most risks that are emerging in reality don't necessarily come from technology, but from men and women, from human beings who haven't applied the processes, who haven't been focused properly from certain parts of a company, for example. So this is a real deep down uh, transformation which is necessary. We've got quantum computing, artificial intelligence. There are going to be more and more opportunities to make these attacks, but it really is a cultural change in our businesses which we need. So all levels are involved. The problem is the, the weakest link in the chain, of course. And that weakest link is where you'll have your bad surprises. So a lot of technology, yes, but also a lot of training and education. Okay, I'm opening up to the, f to the room now. Here we are in a world of major uncertainties. Raise your hand if you have a question, say who you are and say uh, the name of the person to whom you wish to put, you put your question. Please wait for the microphone before you start speaking. Raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. I've got a question for all of the panelists. Are you aware that by talking about tectonics, the question wasn't really formulated correctly? I'm not going to talk about the difference between communities and a block. A block is the Warsaw Pact, where there was no freedom. There was automatic intervention when a country was to leave. The United States did not invade France in 66. And we are not living in a world of blocks. A block would m means the absence of freedom. It means, uh, uh, like in 14, we are not in that situation. We have a, an Atlantic alliance which is full of freedom, and all of the we left wing West joined it. The Shanghai organization is not a block, it's a military uh, alliance. So, by using the word block, we are increasing the population's fear. We are creating instability for businesses and we are deceiving the public by saying that we're on the verge of a worldwide declaration. So, okay, tectonic, uh, tectonics of blocks is not the right phrase. If What would you choose? Well, a f I'm a former ambassador and I worked with Hubert Vidrin and so we worked on the concepts. So we are in a group where there are three huge subgroups. There are, there's the NATO, enlarged NATO, with Japan and, uh, and all the rest, South Korea. We've got the world of the BRICS, Shanghai, which is heading in there. And then we've got the others, which we mentioned, i.e. those who are excluded, the, um, the, those who are on the outskirts of history. Well, my question now. My question is to say that we should get out of this term, not use this term, because it's very frightening if you're saying that we're living in a world of blocks. It means that we're on the eve of the war. I do not believe that we're on the eve of a, a, an international war. Arantxa, do you want to come back? Are we living in a world of blocks or not? Are we on the verge of war? Well, I, can't, I haven't got a crystal ball, but what I can say is that there is a risk of fragmentation in terms of the governance of the world and that fragmentation risk is very clear in terms of uh, the economy and trade with part of the world 
that would follow certain commercial rules and another part of the world which is following other commercial rules and a third part of the world which has to choose uh, between which of the other two blocks it wants to uh, trade and that is a risk that exists but having said that does one imagine then that we're heading towards a third world war but I have no clue but I think we have to identify how we can avoid this fragmentation, not only in ideology, politics and, and uh, the economy, we have to go beyond that. This is a question which uh, needs to be addressed. Jean-Marc Alamy, uh, no, we're not looking towards war. We've got in our mind uh, continued globalization. I've already explained that. I think we're going to have the world breaking down into regions. Uh, and the outlines of these regions will become clearer, I think, in the coming years. We fear that when the, if there is this uh, mindset of blocks, then we're going to have to make a choice. But that is not what we are seeing. That is not what we are promoting. All of the colleagues who I work with, who are at the head of uh, companies, they're all striving towards a globalization. They, are, they will have uh, the most benefit from uh, globalization. And that's what the businessmen and women are saying. But are politicians listening to us? Who knows? Well, thank you very much. Is there any more, any more questions from the floor? Yeah, Guillaume Clussard. Uh, I used to work at the European Commission, Council rather. So as has been rightly said, the, we need to be dynamic. We know that during a war, industrialists, scientists, politicians all got together to make sure that Europe existed. That dynamic is no longer with us, sadly, because there's Davos, etc. They're, they're not really talking about European structures. So the Europeans don't have a platform where they can talk about what the future holds. And if you don't have a platform to talk about the ideas, then you can't defend your ideas. So how do we go about creating these? The second question is uh, for Sir Peter about the alliances. Yes, I know that uh, about these alliances, but when you go to New York or to Washington, you see that there are more people who are looking towards war. Uh, among the dem Democrats thinking that Europe will follow and they're taking uh, advantage of that to uh, get people to uh, drop out uh, technologically, technologically speaking, politically speaking and uh, if the uh, Europeans take leadership in technology then we will have a discussion then we can be a leader but so how do we create that technological leadership because the very fundamental problem is the same as China is facing facing so, uh, Ambassador, would you like to come back on this question of alliances? Okay, dropping out. Well, that's not what the Americans are looking for. They are looking for a breach with China. I, and I don't like to use the word block, but centers of interest, perhaps, instead, sketched out by financial, economic systems, digital systems, the separate internets. So the two separate worlds uh, with where the risks have been removed from, and the Americans are seeing Europe and Asiatic allies and us with them, all in that same sphere, that center of interest. But there is American protectionism. There are going to be the elections, and so they are being protectionist. And that will uh, foster nationalization of uh, the supply chain and new technologies. And we have to combat that. We have to try and work with our friends rather than uh, renationalize uh, technology and supply chains. We've got a final question from the room. We've only got five minutes remaining. So gent uh, the gentleman has a question there. A quickie. Well, thank you very much for giving me the mic. I'm Jean Gilbert. I work in the social services. And my question is uh, taken from through the uh, looking glass of Africa. So we're, today we're talking about energy transitioning and biodiversity. 
There is one country which is four times bigger than France, and it's the uh, RDC. I want to know what is the relationship between the African continent and France and Europe via this country, RDC, which is being uh, presented as a solution in terms of energy transitioning and biodiversity. Thank you very much. And a final question, and we can answer both of those at the same time. Arantxa, will you talk about Africa and Europe? And there's a young gentleman here at the front. Tell us who you are and what your question is. Hello, Enzo Menestre. I'm a student. You've all rightly talked about European unity in terms of that uh, possible conflict between China and the States. Can that European unity not be called into question when we see all of these liberal democracies rising to the surface? In Hungary, uh, since Urban arrived, and also to a lesser extent in Poland and Slovakia, is this European unity not threatened by those very liberal regimes? Well, Hubert Vedring, talk about the unity of Europe. You have a vision of what awaits us, given the different uh, political shifts in different countries. Uh, too many interesting questions here at the end of our session. It's just a shame. The difficult thing that we have here is finding the correct terms to define each situation. Globalization, for example, fragmentation, uh, splitting, de-risking, blocks, not blocks. So. Over 20 to 30 years, we were using very simple terms. They were so inaccurate in macroeconomics, geopolitics, and globalization. It, it, the words just didn't really mean anything anymore. And it wasn't working, as people were expecting. So it all uh, exploded in all kinds of formula. For example, an international community, that's a term that you'll hear all the time. There is no international community. The term of community is a very warm term. But if you're in a community with Putin or with China or with the Islamists, well, there's many, many words which are weighing down our discussions and our seminars. So we have no longer any idea what we're talking about. So you have to, you have to spend a quarter of an hour defining your vocabulary. We'll talk about Europe. Well, I'm for subsidiarity. I think that Europe should focus on essential issues, i.e. defending its civilization from the rest of the world. And I don't think that is what the European Parliament's job is, to homogenize all of these com countries. That wouldn't work anyway. I think today we have we need an, an integrationist treaty which hasn't been signed and it would not be ratified anyway. So as far as Europe is concerned, I would say that we need a historical deal, an agreement, a contract between European uh, uh, elites and the populations, the populations who have just given in. There aren't a lot of pro-Europeans in the population. There is a tiny minority of anti-Europeans. There's a huge minority of Eurosceptics. And uh, let's not take the word sceptical as being hostile. There are Eurosceptics. They could become pro-European if Europe were to redefine its goals in a more concrete and more structured strategic way. Thank you, Hubert Vedrin and uh, Ambassador Ricketts. And then Arantxa will wrap up. We haven't forgotten that question about Africa and Europe. Yes, I'd just like to come back on the question of European unity. In my opinion, we need to stop imagining that you can put all countries in the same mold. The idea of integration, a single European model, that doesn't work. We need to accept diversity, difference. Difference can be a strength. And that's uh, one thing. And then to say a thing about the UK, we have to learn how to live with a third party country which was a member, an important member, remains a military power. And it's important to find a new way of cooperating between this third party country, which is also a friend and a partner of all countries in Europe. OK, Arantxa now, wrap it up. Uh, Africa is the only place in the world where we know we can across three things, uh, a competitive economy, solidarity, and democracy. And if we lose democracy, then we are not Europe. Let's not, in Europe, we have to take care of our own democracy here without thinking of other 
countries. That's what makes Europe, Europe, our democracy. Coming on to Africa now. Africa is facing the same difficulties as Europe. Africa does not want a world where you've got the East against the West and you'd have to choose one or the other. And that is why Europe needs to pay more attention to the needs and to the interests and to the opportunities in Africa. And I think some words have been said that you have to take a closer look at Africa and Africa where which is working more with uh, Europe, with more partnerships, starting on the subject of climate change, where Europe and Africa have both done their duty. They didn't really have a duty because they account for 1% of emissions around the world. But together, we must fight to make sure that others' emissions can be reduced if we hope to continue to live on this planet. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause and enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conferences.